Uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, oops, back one. Oh, I don't want that. What's going on? There we go. Uh, my name's Barney Nichols. Um, I mean, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I've started to be using it in my job. I've been doing uh, some things on text summarization, um, some image classification. I've also uh, been looking at things more for my own sort of views, like facial recognition I find interesting, or an augmented reality. Um, I've been using things like uh, TensorFlow, Dialogflow, uh, the Microsoft Cognitive Services, uh, the bot frameworks, and they're really interesting. And these are all what we are considering mm -hmm. to be artificial intelligence. And where these things are going, um, we're yet to see. So well, I'm going to go back a while. Um, I don't know, when I was a, a lad, many years ago, um, there was this, ZX Spectrum. This is an emulator, of course, but it allowed you to uh, type programs into a computer, and then <coughs> it would let you run programs. There we go. Well, there we are. Yay! All right, not particularly useful, <coughs> but in the manual, I mean, we used to manage it, manage, use it for playing games, but then I started looking through the manual, and this is what sort of got me into programming. Um, within the manual, there were listings of programs. This is long before disks and things were invented, and you'd type these listings in, and you'd end up with a program. Um, the one that I sort of considered to be artificially intelligent at the time was a game called Pangolins. Now, it's quite a simple game, as you see here. It's asking me to think of an animal. And then it's asking, does the animal live in the sea? I go, yes, it does. Am I thinking of a whale? Mm -hmm. I wasn't. But that's quite a good guess, isn't it? No, I was thinking of a crab. Oh. No. What is it then? It's a crab. I thought I told him that. So what signatures are a whale and a crab? It's asking me questions. It's in interacting with me. OK, um, the crab has a shell. Um, what's the answer for a crab? Well, yes, it does. OK, so do I want another know the go? Yes. And it's asking me to think of an animal. Does it live in the sea? Yes. Does it have a shell? It's asking me the question. It's learned something. Yes, and now am I thinking of a crab? Yes, I am. So this, with me, was amazing. And if you played this for a while, it seemed to me that after just a very short period of time, you couldn't think of any more animals. And it, it learned. It was clever. It knew how to tell all these animals apart. Of course, it wasn't. But to me, this, this felt like artificial intelligence. Right, let's go back, figure out how to do it. There we go. OK, so what is artificial intelligence? It's something where we'd like something to learn. Uh, what are the things we're, sorry, sorry. What are the things we're coming across at the moment we consider to be sort of artificial intelligence? We've got um, artificial assistants like uh, Google, uh, AI assistant, uh, Siri, um, Cortana. These things are all being very clever. Um, there's chatbots which you interact with probably more often than you think. Um, we're starting to deal with big data. Um, artificial intelligence is using to crunch all this up and give us information that... Uh, we didn't see before. And so this is using machine learning techniques, deep learning, and natural language processing. But what do all these things really have in common? They're all using neural networks. Okay? And neural networks are quite a few different types. Quite complicated, some of them, some of them are a bit simpler. We've got lots of different types, the recurrent, convolutional, uh, generative adversarial, feed forwards, and um, deep reinforcement learning. So what I'm going to do to do is talk to you about each of these different types of networks. But first, what is an artificial intelligence? It's something that can <coughs> learn, something that can uh, solve a problem, and something that's able to handle new situations. Um, so what types of learning would these things be using? Well, we started off with explicit learning. This is where you would train, you'd write the actual steps the thing's going to carry out. Um, this is how we started off when we were programming, uh, but these are quite limited in what they do. And if anything outside of the area of its expertise, it falls over. 
So they started encoding domain knowledge, where so you set up uh, rules and uh, facts about some information. And then an inference engine would then deduce potentially more rules and facts from this. Uh, these seem quite good and were very often used in um, medical diagnostics, uh, logistics, and things like that. But again, they're not perfect. We've also started to use statistical pattern detection. Uh, we've learned how to solve a problem by identifying um, patterns in data. OK, but how do we learn? We will usually think of a question. We have a question. We then think about the question. And hopefully, then, we get an answer. OK? So how do computers learn? Well, they've got, um, usually have an input, some data. OK? They then process this data and have an output, a prediction of what's coming out. OK, so what are we trying to achieve? We're going to take our input, some data. We're going to put it through a function. And at the end of the function, we're going to get a prediction. OK, but we're going to do this in the learning. We're not going to teach it. We're not going to show it the function. We're going to teach it. So let's go for an example. It's a very simple one. We're going to take a weight in stones. We're going to push it through a function. And then we're going to calculate the weight in kilos. Super simple. OK? So we've got our weight, 10 stones. Nice, simple number. OK? But we're training this network. OK? We know there's a function there. We don't know what to do in there yet. But we already know, because we're going to train, we start off with some predetermined facts. And our fact at the moment, the truth, is that 63 kilos, just over. OK? So we start off with our weight, that stands. We have a function, we're going to do 10 somethings with this weight, and it's going to give us our answer. <coughs> so, our 10 watts. Well, we're not going to use algebra to work it out. We're going to use a number, we just pick it at random, five. OK, will this work? So it's going to answer 50 kilos. No, we're out. Okay? We know the truth, 63 kilos. So we've got an error. Our prediction is wrong. We have an error in our prediction of about 13 kilos. Okay? So let's try again. We're training the network. It's been through once. That didn't work. It's going back, using the prediction error to change what it did. So let's try increasing our value. Let's do it by six. 60 kilos. Our truth is 63, so we're getting closer. We're now just three kilos away. OK, that's good. Let's try again. Seven. Ah, now, you're probably all being great mathematicians. Whereas that's now 70 kilos. We've gone, our target was 63 kilos. We're now over by six and a half kilos. So we've actually gone past. We've jumped past where we had hoped to be. So what do we do about that? Well, as we get closer to our answer, we're training each time. We're thinking, well, we went up by too much. We jumped too far ahead. So let's just jump a little bit further ahead. Let's bring that down. Let's reduce our learning rate. So let's try a little bit, like 6.2. Where does that get us? 62 kilos. Pretty close. Our answer was 63 kilos that we're trying to get to. But we're one and a half kilos out. Now, to be fair, this may be enough. This may be close enough to the answer you need. You don't necessarily need to have the exact answer. But what I've shown is that you don't need to know how you're going to do it to start with. By using random values and then using those prediction of errors to go back into your function, you can get closer and closer to the answer you need. OK, so what did we just do? We almost got an answer to our question. Almost. We've shown that you can approximately get a result of an answer to your question using random values and repeating the process, feeding the values back in, can get you closer and closer to the truth. Um, adjusting our learning rate helps us get closer to the truth. Okay, so let's move on a bit. We're going to take some data, 
we're going to have a function, and it's going to make a prediction. Now, the last example I showed you was super simple. As things get more complicated, we're going to have more data coming into these, <coughs> into our function. More and more. Some of this data will be more important than other data, so we might need to give it a weight. Say, this thing is more important. I need to listen to this more than this value. And this one, I'm really not bothered about. Okay? This could just sum all these values in our function and pass them out to our prediction. But that might not be the answer. We might not say, I just get too much noise. So we very often will put in here a threshold function, we call it, which says, only give me a prediction if it goes over the threshold. Okay? So this is starting to look quite a lot like this. This is a diagram of a neuron that we find in the brain of most animals. <coughs> We've got inputs, some of which are be given more value than others. We have a, a node in the middle that carries out the function. It listens to these inputs and then decides when it reaches a threshold to pass it through, down, onwards to somewhere else in its network. And the networks can be quite simple. A worm, for instance, a nematode, has about 300 neurons. With that, it's able to live, feed, reproduce. Humans, we've got about 86 billion neurons in our heads. With that, we're able to live, feed, reproduce. I don't know what the rest are for. <laughs> um, so, this is a neuron. These are connected together in a neural network. So, this is sort of a diagram of a neural network. So, rather than a, a function, we have a node. Okay, we usually start with an input layer. Uh, these have connections to the next layer. Uh, this is a hidden neuron layer, normally called. And then we have our outputs. When we initialize something, when we train it, we will set um, threshold values in here and random uh, initialization values. Okay, so we don't know what will happen as we go through it. And this steps retreated. So we start off putting some information in and it propagates forward through the layers to the end. Okay, so we've had a function, it's got some, made some predictions, if it's reached the threshold, it goes through to the next. Then at the end of this, we'll probably have an error. So we'll use that error, we use what's called backward propagation, to adjust the weights within the network, to adjust the functions. Okay, so if you use this with each of your piece of data, each training step, you eventually will get to an answer, and hopefully it'll be close enough to what you need. Okay, so this is a bit more complicated. This is a feed-forward neural network. Okay, so they tend to have um, more than one. So we have our input layer, and then usually more than one hidden neuron layers. Okay, and then finally an output. So how would one of these sort of work? What could you use it for? Well, you could train it on something like a set of faces. Okay, so the input you're bringing in is a face. Now, the first, these layers work differently. So the first layer, for instance, might look for super simple things like vertical lines, diagonal lines, horizontal lines. Okay, and it would, given the threshold, it would say, right, I found a vertical or horizontal. It could then pass it on to the next layer. And the next layer might look for things slightly more complicated. Things like uh, eyes, nose, and mouths. Okay, so we're building up. And then the next layer, so right, well, if you've given me enough information, I can now see if I can try and find some actual faces in this data. Okay, so as these build up, you eventually could go from having a face, these are all trained, and then you could give it as un un uh, unknown data, and eventually it could pop out with things like names of people. Okay? So that's um, a feed-forward neural network. And this is, a, I'm going to talk now about a convolutional neural network. Uh, these are the ones I've probably played with the most. Um, convolutional neural network takes a 2D array, usually, of information, an image. Okay, each uh, pixel within the image, so sort of, is a neuron, in the input layer. This is then fed through bit by bit into what's called a convolutional layer. This is a sparse number, it's not as connected as the uh, previous example I showed you. And this convolutional layer uses uh, filters to 
to simplify the image. It uses uh, filters for uh, edge detection, uh, blurring, uh, sharpening, so it finds some information in there. This usually then goes down to uh, pooling layers, where it uh, simplifies the information more and more. Okay. This is then usually repeated, so we go through more convolutional layers and more pooling layers until we get an answer. We said, what is this? We've gone through all these layers. You usually have a couple of uh, neural layers right at the end, just a stand-up network, and it might give you an answer. <coughs> it's a cute kitten. Ah. So that's a convolutional neural network. A deconvolutional network is very similar. As you can see here, you've got convolutional layers, pooling layers, but this works the other way. We would give it an input, say, I would like to see a picture of a cute kitten. It then works the other way, up through the layers, and hopefully eventually can we give you a new self-generated image. Um, so convolutional neural networks are very interesting. They're very useful for uh, things like image processing, uh, recognition, uh, video analysis, language processing. And we're on to the next one, OK? Um, so that was convolution, very good for imaging. So a recurrent neural network is very good for uh, things that have got a, a time sequence, uh, stocks and shares, and other things. Again, we've got a simple neural network, with input, hidden neuron, output. OK? Um, by uh, convention, there's normally uh, X for your input, H for your hidden layer neuron and Y for output. Now, a recurrent neural network is slightly different. Most of the networks we've seen so far move forward as they process things. A recurrent one can actually feed back on itself. OK, so if we turn that around a little bit. OK, so we've still got our input on hidden neuron and our output, X, H, and Y. But we're going to use this over a sequence of time. We're going to unfold what happens to this. OK? So here's our network. It was, it's our hidden neuron, H1, is going to use the input from X1 to calculate the output. That's so simple. But what happens in the next step, so our next time step, so something's happened, the next thing happens, our hidden neuron is going to use the input from its layer. It's also going to use the input from the previous layer, the output of the previous layer, so it knows what's going on to give it its output. So these steps can repeat again and again as time goes on. So you probably use this today, I expect, most of you. A recurrent neural network. You may well have done. They're very often used in phones and things like that for predictive text. Okay? Um, so this is, I typed the word H, it's the first step in my recurrent neural network. Okay? So this is our first input. It looks at um, other instances of the letter H in words uh, at the beginning and assumes that, okay, he's typed a lot of the word hi in the past. So I'm going to predict he's typing to set the word hi. But, and I come from the second step, I enter the letter E. So it looks back at the previous step and says, oh, he put the word H, H, E. So it's probably not hi he's after now, it's probably worth either hello or help. He typed that a lot as well. Um, but then we go on to the next step, we type in another letter, an A. And of course, if I'm typing those three letters, I'm always going to be typing this. <laughs> All right, so we looked at that, that was a recurrent neural network, and they're very good for like natural language processing, uh, speech recognition, language translation, uh, conversation modeling, and that sort of thing. Okay, oh, an image capturing, okay. Right, so these are probably my favorite ones. A uh, generative adversarial network. Okay? Um, they consist of two parts, really a generator network and a discriminator network. Okay, it's called adversarial because what you try to do is you get these two to battle act. All right? The generator network produces synthetic data, fake data, and says, I think this is real. The discriminator looks at it and goes, Yes, it is. No, it isn't. So they both battle against each other. One tries to produce things that would trick the other one, and the other one goes, ah, this is good or bad, I don't know. So as time goes on, uh, they get better and better at it. So if we were to have a library of real images, 
that we can produce into, into our network, and an image generator that produces fake images, we can have our discriminator that can try and detect the difference between the real and the fake. So, next is a little bit of a video clip, so I don't think this will work. So what tends to happen is the generator starts off and it will usually be just random noises outputting. And the discriminator network will go, yes, I can see that, no, I can't. So, whether we can... Where are we going? Oh, I saw the mouse then for just a second. Okay, so it generates random noise, which it then passes to the discriminator network and says, was that a face, for instance? And it goes, no, it wasn't. So it's, oh, I'll try again. And you'll see that usually over a period of time, this random noise um, we can become more and more um, face-like. So you see faces starting to appear in this just random data. Um, that's quite good, but that's actually very simple, that version. So they've used these in a lot higher versions. This is a generative adversarial network, a GAN, that was used um, to create fake celebrities. Um, they used 200,000 pictures of real celebrities and then told it to go ahead and create some fake ones. So it's using all that information that's coming in and these two networks are working their way together and it starts coming up with these. So these aren't real celebrities. These are fake celebrities. These are generated by a computer. They don't exist. But they just look real to us. So as you see, things are getting very clever with their uh, networks. If you look on YouTube, there's like hours of this, and it's just like, ah. <laughs> Okay, so our generative neural network, they're very good for image generation. They're great for image enhancement. Um, they can fill in areas of missing data. They can help reduce noise. Um, they can also create uh, text generation. Um, you've probably seen or or heard uh, poems and songs that have been created by robots and computers now. Um, this is probably what they use. Um, it's great for speech synthesis, uh, drug discovery, um, sort of things where you know, it can just help improve each itself. Um, so the last one I'm going to talk about is reinforcement learning. Uh, this is where we have an agent that is in an environment, okay, and the agent wants to know how to interact with the environment and achieve a goal. Um, it can carry actions that will affect the environment, the environment will feedback its state, and if the agent does things well, it'll get a reward. Um, what sort of thing are we talking about? Well, autonomous driving, cars. This is a real deep reinforcement learning. Uh, its environment is the world. Okay? So it's looking at actions it can carry out. This is like speed up, slow down, turn left, turn right. Uh, the world is feeding back the state. Uh, what position am I in the world? Where, how, what speed am I travelling at? Uh, can I see any obstacles? Is there a corner coming up? Is there a vehicle around? Okay, and it can feed back rewards. And the rewards would be uh, something like you've driven a mile without hitting anything. Yay! <laughs> um, you get to your destination. These are all things that can feed back into uh, these reinforcement learning techniques. So these things have been used a lot for things like uh, learning how to play chess, uh, learning how to play Go, um, they help us drive vehicles autonomously, drones autonomously. Um, they're helping in the world of robotics, management, and finance. They are starting to uh, outperform humans in a lot of these things. Okay, so um, what's next in the world of artificial intelligence? A lot of what we considered artificial intelligence used to be... Um, what we used to consider artificial intelligence now no longer is. I mean, optical character recognition mm. is just commonplace technology. Um, lots of things I use endpoints for it used to be complicated things that I have to build networks for. I can just pass the file off, say, give me the information back, and back it comes. Um, I think it's a long way off till we get like a general artificial intelligence, something that can learn as well as we do in any given situation. But there's a, a lot of things coming up and the next few years, I think, will uh, surprise us. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the Google I.O. conference. I don't know if this will play or be loud enough. Um, but their assistant, 
the next level of the system is uh, improving. So this is a talk between uh, a bot and a hair salon. The robot, the chatbot, whatever, has phoned up the hair salon and is then going to interact with a human at the other end. Um, I don't think we're going to hear it. All right, so it's actually talking to the system. You can see the uh, it's interjecting okay. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as there's pauses in the conversation. It's acting very like a, a normal human being. The uh, salon on the other end just does not know they're talking to a robot. That in itself could be a bad thing, but that's uh, not for this talk. <laughs> um, and the interaction, I've seen a few other ones this, uh, with, is just amazing. The voice synthesis, the interaction, the picking up the information from what the uh, person has own saying and then feeding back is amazing. <clears throat> so, this would be great. I mean, I could say on the Sunday to my assistant, I need an appointment with the dentist, can you book it for me? And it would then phone up Monday morning and book me a dental appointment. But uh, I think that's the future, so we shall see what happens with that. So, that's it really from me. Um, any questions? You said you're using it, it, it actually currently in some of your projects. Well, personal projects, I guess, more than anything, yeah. Um, the, what, what we do, um, one of our main products is we, we uh, look at scanned documents. And a human currently says, that's an invoice, uh, that's a medical record, that's a statement. And we thought we could probably do this with some image classification. Um, so use TensorFlow and a, a smallish data set and trained it up. And yeah, we seem to find that it's very good at telling, recognizing scanned documents from one type of document to another. You could take that another level using a Tesseract or something to do uh, the OCR from the document as well, then you feed that in. Um, so I think there's lots of possibilities we could go with. So following up on Ben's question, um, so you, could, you could program recognition like that, just with traditional program. Where do you see the efforts? Is there Gains on effort of actually producing the AI system, which would do that filtering or that recognition for you over the traditional way of thinking about the system. Um, I would say it's probably a lot easier to do it with uh, a neural network. For instance, we've got a massive archive of stuff that's already been indexed. You could write a program that goes through and figure out all the steps you need to do, um, do you know, and program it to do that. Or you can just point a fairly simple uh, TensorFlow, the deep um, inception network, at some already categorized information, and it will do it for you. So, okay, anybody else? Are a lot of them um, open source systems so you can use to play with? Uh, yes, I mean, I've, not, I've used uh, TensorFlow, Dialogflow, uh, the Cognitive services and they're all, all free levels, or at least you can use to play with them all. Yeah, I can't remember which type it was, but the one with the H's, yeah, H1, H2, H3. Yeah. Is there a variation where they can pre empt all the H's? Do you know what I mean? So the feedback doesn't, there's no time lag, you just have an instant. Um, I, I believe so. There's, there's the, uh, yeah, the recurrent neural network. There's lots of ones, because they sort of think of it as a short-term memory, um, and there's lots of ones I'm not hugely familiar with that actually will do different things. They've actually got forget nodes and things like that. It's all sort of clever things to help improve the performance of them. What's the coolest future project that you've got in mind for a play with AI? What's your pet one you've got stashed away on the side there? <laughs> What I've been thinking about recently is uh, my daughter suffers from diabetes. So I'd love to come up with a way that I could help her life. And even if that's such a thing as um, showing the packaging to your phone and it automatically ordering a replacement prescription. So it's all right, oh yes, 
you've used up X amount of these, let's all your replacement prescription, or something that actually can um, use AI to do proper management of the, the insulin requirements. So we shall see. <laughs> Anybody else? No, well, thank you very much for your time. Um, uh, this is some of the resources I've used um, to put this together. They're um, free or, or free down this way at least and uh, relatively easy to access. I believe Tariq Rashid is actually doing a talk at Avril on the Beach this summer, so well worth going to watch. Okay. He's just moved to Halston, I think, or on the Lizard. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's moving down and not the top. Yeah, I read his book and I found it really good. It, it, it made it a lot simpler for me. So, yeah, we should probably get him into the talk. That'd be good. Um, and I'll leave you running with this. This is um, using Google DeepMind. Um, and it's using uh, one that was trained just to see um, animals. So. This is a video of a guy going around a supermarket and the computer can't see supermarkets but it can see animals. So it gets very trippy. I can imagine with a VR headset and this <laughs> running live, walking around your local supermarket would be interesting. <laughs> this, this is actually how um, so, uh, psychologists actually start understanding um, reality, perception of reality, because um, from when you're growing up, um, it's learning just like the AR systems, neural networks you've been talking about. It makes guesses, and then it has reinforcement reactions and um, triggers, which will say, yes, that's closer to reality. Slowly over time, as you're growing up, we build up that. Now, we then end up with a set of rules which dictate what we're perceiving and guessing about what we're perceiving. We usually that's pretty solid. But things like LSD and that, they start stripping away those rules of it. And that's why when you end, up, in, you end up with imagery like that. Like this. <laughs> so that rule set is really important on your perceptions. <laughs> yes, there we are. Right. Thank you all very much.